Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Ask Me Anything live video series. If you missed our last Ask Me Anything on what's really happening at the U.S.-Mexico border, you can still see it on Highest Pennsylvania's YouTube page on our website at www.highestpa.org and in the video section of Highest Pennsylvania's Facebook page. My name is Katherine Miller Wilson. I'm the executive director of Highest Pennsylvania, a nonprofit whose mission is to provide immigration, legal, and social services to immigrants and refugees. Today, our conversation will focus on Afghan refugees coming to the United States with special immigrant visa, otherwise known as SIV status. As you know, when the United States recently withdrew from Afghanistan, the Taliban quickly regained power and took over the country. Tens of thousands of Afghans have been trying to flee to safety. We have called upon President Biden and the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, to admit more Afghan refugees and humanitarian parolees and to waive the restrictive application fees that our government charges all applicants for humanitarian parolee status, a more than $500 per person fee. Today, we are excited to be speaking with Highest Pennsylvania's own Lucy Rabah and Mohammed Sadiq Sadid. Lucy is the Director of Social Services at Highest Pennsylvania, and Sadiq is Highest Pennsylvania's office manager and a former Afghan SIV who Highest Pennsylvania resettled in Philadelphia in 2019. Lucy will shed some light on how the special immigrant visa status for Afghans has unfolded during the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, while Sadiq will tell us about his experiences as an SIV and how the past month has been for him and his family. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions already. We're excited for our conversation today. If you haven't already done so, please submit any questions you have during the next half hour in the comments section below. If we don't get to them during this live conversation, we will answer them in the comments. Please keep your questions general. If you have specific legal questions or need legal representation, please contact Highest Pennsylvania directly. We cannot give legal advice on Facebook Live. We would also love to hear your ideas about topics for future videos. We hope that through this video series, you can ask any questions you have and learn the truth about immigration and refugee resettlement in the US. Welcome, Lucy and Sadek. Thank, Thank you for having us. I'll start with questions from me. So Lucy, can you tell us what is special immigrant visa status and who qualifies for it? Yeah, there are only two nationalities who qualify for the special immigrant visa status, um, and they are Iraqis and Afghans. So, Congre uh, so Congress has enacted a series of legislative provisions since 2006 uh, to, en to enable certain Iraqi and Afghan nationals to become U.S. lawful permanent residents. These provisions make certain Iraqis and Afghans eligible for special immigrant visas who worked as translators or interpreters or who were employed by or, or on behalf of the U.S. government, U.S. armed forces, or under chief of mission authority. So um, to apply under the SIV program for Iraqis and Afghans, uh, prospective special immigrants must submit a petition to the Department of Homeland Security. An Iraqi and Afghan SIV applicant whose petition is approved and who is abroad is required to have an in-person visa interview at the U.S. Embassy or consulate abroad to determine visa eligibility. Once they enter the United States, SIV recipients are granted LPR, which is the legal permanent resident status, and they are eligible for the same benefits, the benefits that the refugees receive. However, the challenging part has been that it's a very lengthy and bureaucratic process, I have to say, and it's only limited to spouse and children, although it's any age or married or unmarried, and it can take several years, really even longer than like three years, up to five years, and there are so many tragic stories that I've heard while while waiting, they're being killed, um, and just really very tragic stories so that we can't really imagine. So. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so Sadek, I wanna turn to you. 
Um, tell us why you felt you had to leave Afghanistan back when you applied in 2016. Thank you so much, Catherine, for the good question and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so every family, they have their own uh, plan, the short-term plan and the long-term plan. And it depends where they live, what they do, how, how involved they were with the mission or with the aligned forces. So they have different reasons for that. Basically for me, why I decided to come to the US, it was uh, to just uh, safeguard my family for a better future and about the things that were going on in the country, whether it's instability, whether it is like uh, life threatening, whether it's like kidnapping of individuals, working with the US mission, you it is for sure that you will get a good package in terms of salary benefits whatever but you are going through a, a whole stress whether it could be like security issues it could be like kidnapping your children uh it could be like uh, um, uh, followed by people that they were anti-government so those threats and those layers just i thought that it's better for my children future to move to a country where uh, they can be educated and they can live in peace and for a bright future and that is the reason i just came in 2019. thank you so much sadik so we have a question from a listener um he wants to know, uh, Lucy, do you know the statuses of Afghans who are arriving in Philly now and has it changed in the past week? Um, so in other words, are they SIV holders, US citizens, Afghan nationals with humanitarian parole or some other status? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Um, so because, you know, the humanitarian crisis that's unfolding in Afghanistan, that really at this time the goal is to get out, you know? So some people, it has a varying degree of a status at this time that includes, of course, US citizens who will try to also get out. There's SIB, um, those with the SIB status who hasn't started a process, SIB's process yet. Someone who's a family member who are also trying to get out with the SIB you know, holder and there, it's a, basically a mixed bag of people. So what's happening at the airport when they arrive is, you know, only not just people landed in Philadelphia because they live here, but it's basically Philadelphia U being used as the second airport. Um, so therefore, once they get here, you know, some people who don't have a state yet will be sent to a military base for, for further processing. And if they're US cities, so they'll be sent uh, they are sent home from there. Great, thanks. All right, we have another question from a listener. Um, she says, what does an SIV holder do if the SIV visa was just issued September 2nd, meaning today, 2021? The website says it will be mailed or available for pickup, but the embassy is no longer in Kabul. Is there an electronic version and is there help to get the family out of Afghanistan? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Sadiq, do you know the answer for that? Uh, yeah. Based on the information that I have, and uh, as I have already shared with Lucy and with Kathleen and those folks that they are helping uh, to resettle immigrants. So I'm still in contact with friends that they are active embassy staff members. And most of them, they have, they have their visas on hand meaning that we know that the flights are not happening and we know that it's not safe to go to a second country. I'm pointing like going to Pakistan or Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. Some people like when they had visas on hand and when the flights were going, they already gone to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and they made their own flights. But some that they have visa on hand they have been notified by the embassy that they have to wait for further instructions. So the further instruction at this point means that they cannot make their own flights because there is no uh, international flights out of Kabul. And on the other hand, 
I believe that U.S. said that uh, U.S. and other alliances, they are in negotiation with the Taliban. And the Taliban say that if you have the right document on hand, now uh, the uh, neighbor countries like Turkey and some other countries, they will rebuild the, the uh, airport and we will not disturb those people that they have the right documents on hand. So for now, there is no a good concrete answer for that. But the hope is that if the Taliban will not stand on their promises, there will be an alternative way for uh, those refugees to be out of Kabul. And it could be through a second country. I also thank you so much, Sadiq. I just want to step out of my moderator role for, for one minute um, to, to offer my thoughts on that question, because there are a group of folks who did manage to get out of Afghanistan and go to third party countries um, who may have received a an, an notification like the one our listener uh, described saying that, OK, as of today, you have SIV status. And so now they have to get themselves to the United States. Um, the, the third party countries are working with our military to, uh, to get them out. And, um, and those folks should be landing in either Philadelphia or, uh, Dulles airport and, um, can that notification that they received, they can show to the military, the military will probably send them to a military base here in the United States to continue the processing, including getting the actual document. Um, and then once that processing is done, then they will be sent to be resettled somewhere in the United States, um, most likely where they have a family tie, but if they don't have a family tie, then somewhere in one of the states that is resettling refugees, um, Pennsylvania is resettling, Philadelphia is resettling, Highest Pennsylvania is one of two resettlement agencies uh, that will receive, be receiving people like that. Um, so hopefully that explains a little bit, but yes, there's information is constantly evolving. Um, so thank you very much for that question. Um, okay, so, um, so Lucy, I wonder if you could take a moment um, to talk about the people that um, we have resettled in the last couple of weeks. I guess, first of all, were they SIVs or were they other statuses? Yes, so it's, um, I would say the past couple of weeks that, you know, since this crisis uh, uh, unfolded, that we uh, have received two SIV families um, so far. So the family, the first uh, family we received about a month ago was a family of three. And then the second uh, uh, family uh, arrived uh, on the 14th of August. So it's, you know, almost becoming a month. Um, that was a family of eight. So, so far we have had, uh, you know, Afghans who had a SIV status. But before this whole U.S. Uh, troop withdrawal and all that happening, that we had one, um, like, you know, we, we have been working with Af Afghan SIVs, either as, you know, coming through the regular U.S. refugee admissions program or people who we call them walk-ins that they didn't come through like the regular channel, but they just come to our you know, agency and ask for, you know, resettlement assistance. So we have seen some walk-ins, you know, some people who come through the, the regular channel. And I, we, I think that that trend will continue as people, as some Africans will be able, you know, uh, it be travel um, and, and come to our, you know, um, our site for asking for assistance. Um, so um, I think that also they just come to us because they Google search us, you know, heard about us by, by word of mouth. And we have, you know, like I said, you know, have some cases in the past and, you know, we'll continue to see that trend. But also that, you know, I'm told that there will be, you know, as Kathy you said, the continuous influx of African rifles at dollars in Philadelphia International Airport until mid uh, to late September um, from, you know, those third, third countries, so Germany, Qatar, UAE, and the bid number, I was told it can be as high as 50,000. 
So their final destination is to use like healthy it will be, you know, will vary depending on where their family or relatives live. And we're also in the US uh, has capacity to welcome these arrivals because you know the ultimately this program will be um, governed, like managed by PRM, the State Department Bureau of Population, Refugees and the Migration. Yeah, so that's great. Thank you so much, Lucy. So I just want to follow up on that one point because um, a listener asked, are there any firm numbers about how many people will be resettled here in Philadelphia by Highest Pennsylvania Nationality Services Center? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. So we, as you can imagine, uh, so as two resettlement agencies in Philadelphia, we work collaboratively, you know, sharing resources, you know, sharing information, best practice and that we do this for the benefit of our clients so it has been really working great so far so when we are contacted by our own national you know agency we are in partnership with that we met again Kathy you know was in the meeting uh, so was I so we you know we want to um, you know really a contribute we want to like have the kind of set a number we have to make a proposal so nsc made a proposal for 100 uh as uh it's a number it was so did with um as 100 for our proposal so i would say if those are the numbers that will come to philadelphia you know that we expect 200 um uh, Afghan families. That's actually, you know, again, I don't want to get too technical, but we people we call parolees, not including SID status or the walk-ins, but just the parolees who arrived in the United States with no status um, will be paroled to enter the states. It will be like around 200 in Philadelphia. Great. Thank you. All right. Another question from a listener. Could you, and this is for you again, Lucy, could you describe briefly what resettlement services involve? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we, the resettlement services are, as I said, the PRM has, you know, some sort of guidelines, what we call, we uh, operate this program under what we call a cooperative agreement. So that actually tells us what the core, uh, our resettlement support service, services should look like. So that includes, you know, going to the airport, you know, for airport pickup, and then take them to the housing and, um, and provide, all, you know, connect them to, you know, and make sure that they get health screening in the beginning, that they have a children. We're also involved in school enrollment and provide ESL services, job search, resume writing, and, you know, um, and connecting them to, to job and all those things. It could be up to three months that that we'll be working with. Wow, sounds like an exhausting job for the staff. How about you, Sadek? Do you remember your first three months in the United States? You want to talk about what that was like? Yeah, for the first three months, I know moving uh, from uh, even a state to another state, and it's so difficult and challenging for me to move from Afghanistan miles, miles ago, and to come to the U.S. It was hard and it was challenging. But uh, I appreciate the uh, highest Pennsylvania and the other agencies existed here. They helped me a lot. Like uh, the first time that I was introduced to highest Pennsylvania, they provided me workshop where I can go with their partners and I can, I can learn some basic st skills about presentation, computer skills, where I can uh, talk with uh, specialists how to write a, a CV based on the standard written in the U.S. Um, on to uh, manage how to enroll my children to school because I didn't know where the school is, uh, take care of their vaccines and take care of our health. So um, from time to time, checking on us to find a house for us and talk because we didn't have credit uh, to talk with their property dealers to manage the house and pay for the rent. So I know that moving, it was so hard. And I I was unable to uh, just think where I can start from. I know that I had to start from the scratch even before. I used to move to the US 
and I thought that I will face challenges, but I really appreciate those programs that are existed, whether in HIAS, NSC, and the, uh, they help not only SIV holders, but also the other colleagues that they come and open the door. So they knock the door and the door is always open for them to help them in any way that is best possible. So the, I know that there are several programs that we got benefit from that. And some of them that I just mentioned, education program, health program, uh, ESL class that is still my wife is studying. And uh, then uh, job employment training and like uh, attending workshops, uh, referring to some of job fairs that I was introduced by my caseworker to go there, to be connected with uh, with uh, employers, how to find a job. So those are, you just name it. And I, I got a bunch of those uh, uh, supports that even I cannot recall it. I know it was two years ago, but just one thing that I can say, I appreciate all and every uh, effort and support that highest staff, NSC staff, Bitney's, whoever that they are existed and they are helping immigrants, I really appreciate them from the bottom of my heart. And today that I'm talking here in uh, uh, highest, just I, I, my message is for those that they are not alone. We are with them and we will support them to the best possible that is uh, existed. Yeah, thank you so much, Sadek. So, um, so Lucy, I want to ask you another question. Um, how has the pandemic and the recent crisis in effect in Afghanistan affected the SIVs that are already here? Yeah, definitely. And, um, but first of all, I'd like to just comment on what Sadik said that as you can hear that it takes the whole village to do this job right. So we cannot really do this job without the support from the community, you know, community members, all of our partners. So that's how we, you know, make this program successful with the help from everybody in the in the community, in the city, at the city level, at the state level, and the national level. So thank you. At the question, yes. So yeah, the pandemic has slowed down definitely the SIV process, no doubt about it. And yes, the recent crisis also definitely affected SIVs in a big way. Um, as you have heard from your clients and your friends, family members, or in the media, that we have Afghan SIVs who travel to Afghanistan before the U.S. troop withdrawal, you know, and could not leave the country before, you know, the August 3rd, 31st deadline, and we have family members left behind who are at greater risk because their family members are associated with the U.S. government or military. And also there are also those who do not qualify for SIV, you know, um, um, because they have, you know, worked with the U.S. They have worked with the U.S. government for not long enough to qualify. So there, that's why we created a, what we call P2 category. That pretty much a catch-all kind of, a, a, you know, a category to people who worked in less than two years so can qualify to come to the United States and also the media organization and the, the nonprofit organization as well. So at this time, you know, there's the people who actually pay to try to also try to help out, but there's the only option that's uh, available to them is just also, I think that those again process are <laughs> taking really long time uh, that are kind of at this time, you know, the probably the best recommendation is, you know, to the goal is to try to get them out is the humanitarian parole process um, that we are trying to mobilize our pro bono attorneys to, to help with that, that legal applications. Um, yeah, that's the we, um, you know, welcomed an SIV family recently that I just said that the, a family of eight who um, arrived at Dollars Airport um, just about two or three weeks ago. And uh, both the resettlement program manager, Jenny, and I got notified at around 5 p.m. that day, on the same day, their family <laughs> just is, is already, on, uh, already on their way to Philadelphia. 
this is a quite challenge as you can see because we normally get notified you get two to four weeks of notice or something one week at least to prepare for their arrival with the airport pickup you know home setup you know had meals you know all other things that we you know um, that we want to like properly welcome them but it wasn't that you know moment at the time so we had to come up with something really really quick to just temporarily house them uh, and the night so we're actually you know lucky in this regard that we called a hotel that is close to the family's u.s tie um in the up northeast uh, Mayfair area and the hotel staff was very welcoming very sympathetic give us a, gave us a discount rate to house them and very welcoming very receptive so I think that that family had a good experience that we're trying to do something in a quick very short time frame um, and that, that family moved into permanent housing last week so yeah Great, thank you so much. Um, so they're in permanent housing. And so does that mean that we stop serving them or are we still working with them? We're still working with them. So, you know, like I said, up to 90 days so that it's only been a month that there's still two more months after that go, you know, of them working with us. So we are, we'll continue to serve, you know, and there was like a Sadiq shared the same service that he received. It will do the same with a job search, employment program, school enrollment, you know, English classes, and then and any other support services, you know, medical assistance, um, all of the things that we really think that, that you know, make that resettlement pro, uh, experience, um, you know, uh, successful and, um, yeah, uh, as, as successful as possible. Great. And so Sadiq, now I'm gonna turn to you as a former SIV and as someone with family still in Afghanistan, uh, what have the past few weeks been like for you? Well, the past few weeks, it was so difficult, challenging, and I say it is challenging. As you all know, my family also, they trapped in Kabul and right after uh, the before the bomb went off, they were inside the airport. And fortunately, they are still in Germany. I'm in contact with them. They are safe. But for sure, it is challenging. And I, before I had an interview with one of the journalists, and I just say that people, they are living in different Zooms, those kind of contacts that I have. I have friends in Dubai. I have friends in uh, Qatar. I have friends in Germany. I have friends... I mean, the network, those people that they are trying to come in uh, Spain, friends from Italy, they do not, most of them, they do not know the time zone. And because they are coming to a new country, the more information they think they get, the better it will be for them, where to go, what benefits they will receive. As somebody that I was an SIV holder, I cannot stop them from those questions. And I just say that. Well, I have to help them. They need my support. And uh, on the other hand, I also have some friends that they are still stuck or trapped in Kabul. They also have some questions like what is the pr procedure? What is the next step? What is the next plan? What will happen to us if we cannot evacuate? Or do they have any alternative options? I hear from friends questions regarding what is the, e the P2 process? What is P1 process? I have to go for it, search for it, and make sure that I have a good answer for them. I know it is like so difficult and challenging, but one thing that uh, to just reassure that I have friends in the community, teammates around me, and supporters, like if they are journalists, they can raise my voice. If it is highest staff, they can always one by one they stop by uh, my office from Catherine, who you can see it, things that happen, she stopped by and she reassured me, she is with me and she support me, like my supervisor. Any staff member, every single day, they wanted to be updated on what is going on in Afghanistan. So that is one thing that reassured me that although for now they think that they left behind, but there are people that they think about you, your children, your family members, your uh, uh, immediate family members, whoever. And if they have the right document, I, I for sure I can say that there will be an alternative option. 
And I hope that the government will soon announce that through which they can step forward and they will be welcome to the US. And like other thousands of refugees that we provide services for them now, we should be able to provide them services as well in the near future. Great, thank you, Sadiq. All right, so we have one more question um, from a listener. Does Highest PA prioritize any youth-specific donations? I'd like to facilitate a toy drive soon, but are there any donations that are more pressing? Thank you for all that you do. So um, I wanna partially answer that and partially uh, give it back to Lucy and then have Sadiq have the closing word. So um, we have an immigrant youth program that provides direct representation to immigrant youth. And we have already, one of the ways that we provide that representation is we partner with a federal shelter where we provide legal services, trauma-informed legal services to unaccompanied minors, those immigrant youth who are here without adults to care for them. Um, and we have already seen, I believe it's five Afghan children uh, who are in that shelter. So um, we are trying to find out their story, how they came to be unaccompanied. Um, we're obviously very distressed for them. They are very distressed themselves. Um, and, uh, and so donations to our organization go to support that work uh, as well as the additional work that we do. In terms of a donation drive, I'm gonna turn it over to Lucy to talk about that and more generally, what are the needs that we have now? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. um, I personally think that really, as Kathy, you talked about, you know, this whole structure of how we're going to provide assistance is changing, right, evolving every single day, that we don't want this particular, you know, fund that, that that's going to be, you know, designated for this particular one. But I think that if we just make it more like a general as you know, as possible that later as where we see the needs that we can direct, um, we all look at that fund to the, you know, um, to uh, you know, to our needs at that time. So, for example, we know that really at this time, you know, I can just emphasize, you know, um, well, I get, you know, um, just can emphasize over and over again, the housing is the biggest need. So we, we definitely, you know, the federal government funds are never enough to be, you know, to this right. And then, you know, it's the public private partnership program. And that's like the, since the inception of it, 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 um, of this program that we always, you know, want to make sure in in the one of the difficulties with this uh, this working with this population now this time is that we as of now hopefully that will change but that they're not eligible for um, public benefits with meaning you know that you know food stamps um, um, in that what other refugee populations will need. So I think that to see housing is really the biggest needs and. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we have enough funds to support them, you know, like the hotel, for example, that we have to house them temporarily, that we have extra funds to pay for it. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, just kind of making it unrestricted, you know, so that we can just reroute and redirect the money with like the best way of, you know, really using the money wisely and effectively. But Kathy, I don't know what you think. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's very helpful. And in terms of in-kind donations, mm -hmm. we have a list um, on our website of the items that we are collecting uh, for those who want to do an in-kind donation drive. Um, so we'll put that link in the chat so you can see that. And so uh, we are running out of time. So I just want to give the floor. We're actually a little bit over. I apologize. But I want to give the floor one more time to Sadek. Um, Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners uh, about your experiences? Um, yeah. Yeah. Just one thing that I would like to, uh, to say it to the audience and to those that they are listening uh, uh, is that uh, without your support and without your cooperation and uh, without your help, we will not be existed. And without these organizations that we have around, the immigrants will not be existed. And the second message that I have, it is to the allies that I know people that 
they left behind and there should be an alternative way either they can put pressure on the uh, people that they should come to a negotiation table at least there should be a clear direction for those that they hope that they support alliances during the two decades war in the country and their family they are uh, in a chaos situation it is a humanitarian crisis we want to raise their voices and if there is a possibility there should be a clear path i just to mention i know friends that they sold their houses properties cars and they they don't know what will be their future so yeah. at least that if there is an alternative way what will be that alternative way how it looks like so in in this time they 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 just need a direction from allies and again to reassure them that once they are here we will serve them better the best possible way and together we can bring a change and that change will be a bright future thank you so much sadik um thank you for today and lucy for today and thank you for your service with the american military um for those of you who want to advocate with congress you know sadik was saying needing a clear path needing to be able to file petitions without having to file filing fees um there is so much advocacy that needs to happen around the people that have been left behind um and so there's information on our website we'll put it in the chat um we're going to take you to a page called uh, what's happening in Afghanistan and Haiti we're keeping that page updated uh with fresh information as soon as we get it we post it um and there are links for helping you to figure out how to advocate as well as how to donate money or in kind uh as well as how to volunteer um so thank you very much uh we are out of time but for all of you who sent questions that we didn't get a chance to answer they will be answered in the comments below um and one more critical note i just want to make sure everybody understands highest pennsylvania remains open during the pandemic we're continuing to provide remote legal and social services to immigrants in the greater philadelphia area of course refugee resettlement are services that have to take place in person um so our staff uh we have many safety precautions that we have in place stay tuned for our next ask me anything and as always you can learn more about how to support DACA recipients, asylum seekers, SIVs, and other immigrants and refugees at www.highestpa.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone tuning in and and listening to us. Thank you so much.